आर सेलिब्रेटिंग गांधी जयंती इन द पीस पैलेस ऑफ द हेग सर आई वेलकम यू इन इंडियंस अब्रॉड थैंक यू could you tell me what are the activities planned today to celebrate gandhi jayanti in the peace palace of the hague we have gathered here this morning to celebrate international day of non violence which is also the birthday of mahatma gandhi the united nations in 2007 designated this day as the day of international non violence we are very glad that participants from more than 20 countries have assembled here this morning in very large number including ambassadors from 18 countries in africa in asia europe north and south america the purpose of the program is to create greater awareness about the importance of non violence in resolving international conflicts so this concept of non violence for making political and social change is as relevant today as was during gandhi ji's time he used it as a very powerful tool in winning independence for india being all together sharing the thoughts and spirit of ahimsa non violence music is one of the most beautiful ways to unite in a very non-violent way we are going to play classical indian music called raga music and the word raga comes from the ancient sanskrit word rang which means color and in our music it means that which colors the mind so today we're going to play a beautiful raga called hindoli or kaushik dhvani and it's a very peaceful raga it's peaceful and it gives confidence to follow our hearts and live in deed and thought ahimsa This palace is a unique venue where the International Court of Justice, the United Nations World Court works daily on international adjudication for states disputing. The Peace Palace is also established for the Permanent Court of Arbitration that does equally but through arbitration. A decade ago, I happened to be in Ahmedabad and of course I visited the ashram of gandhi this visit has left an everlasting impression on me i'm working at the peace palace for almost two decades and i'm still impressed by the peaceful settlement of international disputes the work of the international courts in the peace palace and i observe on a daily basis also people who hope to receive hope for a better and peaceful world and um therefore they come to the temple of peace the peace palace i sincerely hope 
that we will attain a better world and abandon violence and replace war by the word. I hope you will have a memorable day today on the Peace Palace grounds like I experienced in Gandhi's ashram. Thank you. Now I would like to invite our chairman, Mr. Ram Lakina, on stage, please. As chairman of the Stichting, Stan Bail Mahatma Gandhi, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you. As you are aware, we have gathered here this morning to celebrate International Day of Nonviolence. The purpose of the gathering this morning is to create greater awareness of the importance and significance of nonviolence as a tool for social change, political change, and in resolving global conflicts without resorting to violence, without loss of human life, without loss of material resources. That is the essence of the philosophy of nonviolence. I wish you a very pleasant and productive morning. Thank you. I would like to begin by thanking Mr. Lakina for having invited me to come and speak a few words this morning and also to congratulate him, his colleagues and the stick thing on 28 years of outstanding service, not just to the Indian community, but to Netherlands, to the people of Netherlands and to the entire world through the work of the stick thing, which seeks to spread the message of Mahatma Gandhi, the message of nonviolence and peace far and wide. So please join me in giving the stick thing a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. This event comes as part of virtually a festival of Gandhi, if I could so describe it, which has been happening since yesterday. We had from the courtyard of the Peace Palace a large Gandhi march which took place yesterday with around 800 people, including many who are here. We had a bicycle personally used by Mahatma Gandhi, which was brought to The Hague yesterday for the public to see and to derive inspiration from. There was an opera called Satyagraha, Mahatma Gandhi's instrument of nonviolence, a small excerpt of which, which was staged yesterday at the Krote Kirk in The Hague. There was also a new book on Mahatma Gandhi released in Dutch language yesterday. Today, there are volunteers who are fanning out to schools of Netherlands in different parts of this country to take the message of Mahatma Gandhi to the youth. There are events which are going to be held in uh, Amsterdam this evening under the leadership of Mr. Lakina and Mr. Pramod Sharma, who's also part of the stick thing. There are a large number of members of the Indian community, including people from the Indian Embassy, who hope to go to the Mahatma Gandhi statue here in The Hague at Hoboma Plain. There is a discussion on Gandhi in TU Delft. There is, in Maastricht University, a cleanliness campaign being organized by Indian students. So there is a flurry of activities in the name of Mahatma Gandhi, which is truly heartwarming, because if there is one country close to the memory of Mahatma Gandhi outside of India, it is the Netherlands. There is no country in the world other than India which has as many streets named after Mahatma Gandhi. There are 30 streets in this small country which has been named after Mahatma Gandhi and that truly reflects, I think, the, both the respect that the people of Netherlands have for Mahatma Gandhi, the commitment they have for the principles that he stood for, nonviolence, most important of all, and tolerance and friendship amongst all people and all communities but also it reflects the internationalist mindset and vision of the people of Netherlands. So I pay tribute to the people of Netherlands and for their friendship with the people of India on this occasion. But truly the seeds 
of the use of nonviolence and of peaceful resistance to oppression and injustice was born in the mind of Mahatma Gandhi in South Africa, where he lived for 23 years. He went and bought a farm called the Phoenix Farm, where he created what we know, what we call an ashram, where he brought people from all parts of the world who believed in all religions, who belonged to all colors, who had all faiths and all convictions. And he said, we can all live together. We are one. The world is one. All religions are the same. They all preach the same truth. Let us show a deeply divided South Africa how people from different parts of the world can live together and can flourish in harmony. And it is this philosophy, after all the agitations that he had made, he became a world famous figure from South Africa. And then the leaders of the Indian nationalist movement invited him and said, Mahatma Gandhi, India needs you. Please come back to India. And having come back to India, Mahatma Gandhi organized one agitation after one agitation. And then in 1930, there was a civil disobedience movement. In 1942, came the final major agitation launched by the Indian National Movement, the Quit India Movement, when Mahatma Gandhi issued a call, do or die. Do or die, the British have to quit India. But in this do or die attempt, people are willing to give their lives, volunteers will give their lives, but no blood will be shed. Not a single British citizen, soldier will be harmed. This will be a peaceful uh, revolution till the end. Mahatma Gandhi constantly said, revolt against the British with all your might. Break unjust laws. Do what you can to protest and to speak out what you believe in. But at the same time, fight with yourself. Fight those tendencies in you which naturally lead you to violence. You have to wage this battle within and you have to wage that battle outside. And never hate your enemy. You have to liberate them from themselves, just as much as you have to liberate yourselves from them. So this is the story of the nonviolent struggle which India waged to gain its independence, something which the world had never seen before, and something which unleashed the process of decolonization. Once India became independent in 1947, one by one, every colonial power had to withdraw from all their colonies, almost all their colonies. And every major country became independent, inspired by India's lead and India's vision and Mahatma Gandhi's example. Thank you very much. Today we speak about non-violence, but let me start to speak about violence. What comes first, violence or non-violence? Can we imagine a society without violence? When we think of the state of nature, do we see the bon sauvage, the noble savage, like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who said that man is born good, but corrupted by society? Or do we see, like Thomas Hobbes, a war of all against all, a state of violent anarchy that only stopped because people learned to live together in society? I think Violence is part of humanity, and throughout history, mankind had worked hard to keep violence under control. I do believe most men see violence as evil. I think they will always stand up against people who want to exploit violence. Some men of high moral standard and esteem, like Mahatma Gandhi, inspire us in this and help us to do the right thing. The concept of a nation state in which the government has a monopoly on the use of force to defend the country, of course, to defend law and order and to keep violence under control is most common in our kind of societies. Of course, this concept has not stopped violence and it has certainly not prevented wars. Maybe it helped to reduce the violence. Gandhi named his non-violence doctrine Satyagraha, I hope I pronounce it right, you probably know better than me. After the Sanskrit words Satya, truth, and Agraha, polite insistence or firmly holding on. He once said, truth, Satya, implies love, and firmness, Agraha, serves as a synonym for force. 
Ideas began to call the Indian movement Satyagraha, that is to say, the force which is born of truth and love, or non-violence, and gave up the phrase passive resistance. Gandhi understood, of course, that his followers needed training to be able to persist their non-violent resistance in the face of crackdown by British colonial powers. He saw that he Satyagrahis must undergo spiritual and physical training to ensure discipline and develop their non-violent reflexes. For this, he created the already mentioned ashrams, founded on principles of social equality and non-discrimination, where his followers were educated and empowered, received political education too, and training in civil actions like demonstrations, protests, boycotts. And it's interesting to see that in 2014, the Indian government asked UNESCO to inscribe 22 of these ashrams throughout India on UNESCO's tentative World Heritage List. So it was a well-organized campaign and it took a long time. And Ambassador Rajamoni spoke so well about the history, so I will not take too long for that. But I think it's important to repeat that uh, the many actions throughout the year started after his coming back to India. And uh, I think in 1919, there was a first major campaign that put him, say, right in the center of Indian politics for independence. In our human rights policies today, we emphasize the promotion of human rights, the protection of human rights. And somehow, we find it very difficult to define what duties correspond to certain rights. I think Gandhi's wise message of putting more emphasis on duties to be first performed before claiming rights and the duty of citizenship to the world is very urgent today and could inspire today's international debate on human rights. In The Hague, ladies and gentlemen, 174 nationalities living together harmoniously. And that is the idea and the ideal which at least I inherited from this great soul called Mahatma Gandhi. Because, ladies and gentlemen, he told us one thing, and I'm going to quote him. He said in his writing, it is no non-violence if we merely love those who love us. It is non-violence when we love those that hate us. I know how difficult it is to follow this grand law of love, but are not all great and good things difficult to do? Love of the hater is the most difficult of all, but by the grace of God, even this most difficult thing becomes easy to accomplish if you want to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, we can preach the whole day today in order to celebrate his life by saying Satyagraha is great and nonviolence is fantastic and all the quotations he left for us. We can preach that the whole day and we will keep each other busy like that. But I think we have to stop preaching. We have to practice it. And that is the challenge which lay ahead. We're not doing it in the United States. We're not doing it in Korea. We're not doing it in the Balkans. We're not doing it in Syria. We are not doing it everywhere. Come on, people, wake up. He was there. He paved the path for us. Let's follow that path. And that path is an inclusive path. That path is a path of solidarity. We have to act. Let's tune it in. Thank you very much indeed.
invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am very glad we have assembled here today to celebrate 148th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi, the greatest soul of our times. Today is also the 27th anniversary of the establishment of this monument in the center of Amsterdam. 2 October 1896, he was born, the hero who made the world better. It's now 148 years ago. He is a hero because he didn't use violence, but he solved problems by talking and being disputant. He always said what he found, but even if that was dangerous. He said, for example, you don't need to have money to be worth it. He mean it, if you're not rich, you're still important. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I think many people know that the statue is here, but on a day like today, we all commemorate the thoughts and ideas and principles uh, of Mahatma Gandhi. People from the neighborhood, they can see and they can hear what Mahatma Gandhi was about. As a chairman of South, uh, Amsterdam South, I think it's really special that we have the statue uh, here. I'm proud of that and that it brings people together. And I hope that everybody who goes past here, be it by car, walking in the tram on their bicycle, and they see the statue, especially now with the flowers around his neck, they think of him and they think of his ideas and principles. And that is my message for today. Think about Mahatma Gandhi and act on his principles, and this world will be a better place. Thank you. From 1936 to 1944, Gandhiji established the final ashram, which was called Sevagram Ashram. In his lifetime, he created these settlements or communities, four of them, two in South Africa, called Phoenix Settlement and Tolstoy Farm, and two in India, called Sabarmati Ashram and Sevagram Ashram. My father was born in Sabarmati Ashram and he spent 21 years with Gandhiji. We used to live in the ashram in a big community of 400 people living together of different nationalities, caste, creed, languages, etc. All under the guidance of Bapu or the father of the ashram. So every morning and evening, Gandhi used to go for a walk and now that's the, he used to take the stick and set out for a walk and his pace used to be very, very fast. So children like this had to run to keep up pace with him. That's how fast he used to walk. And sometimes at the end of the walk, he would put all his weight on the children's shoulders and hang around there, asking them to run with his weight. So that was the sense of humor that Gandhi had. That's how much he enjoyed life. He is also somebody who lived a long life. And now he's enjoying a longer afterlife. So that itself is a very interesting thing. But about myself, I was born in Sevagram Ashram. And at that time, my father was an adolescent. So he had an opportunity to work with Gandhiji at that time. He opted to work with Gandhiji for the next 10 years of his life. And in his childhood, Gandhi treated him as a friend with whom you could even quarrel without qualms. But when my father started working with him, he became a very hard taskmaster. Every detail had to be adhered to. One had to be very punctual, very disciplined, and very, very sincere and efficient in everything that was going on in the ashram. So these are the learnings that I have about this man who established these settlements or ashrams, which was a model of community living of a face-to-face non-violent society, of, of uh, sharing joys and sorrows, vices and virtues, sins and saintliness. That was a life in which there was a mingling of political and spiritual aims. That gave them an unprecedented character. So all this while we were growing up and absorbing all those vibrations, that stayed on. And in Sevagram Ashram, Gandhiji had specially started his entire school the concept of education called basic education or nai talim. And I have studied in the basic education school uh, like a child. And this was a learning based on some very, very productive skills and of labor. 
So somebody who would complete that education would come out of the school totally equipped to handle the world, to take care of their needs. So that is the kind of education that I have studied that is really spoken of very highly and lots of people are following it. In the ashram, there used to be four community activities in which everyone had to participate. The first one was community prayers. In the morning at 4 a.m. and 5 p.m., it used to be held like this, at absolutely like this, in open air, under the tree, and songs from all the religions used to be sung during those prayers. Gandhiji said that ultimately all the religions point to the same truth. Therefore, we must all understand and study the essence of each other's religion in perfect humility and have an attitude of reverence towards the practitioner of different religions. He always encouraged interfaith dialogue. And that was one community activity that all of us participated, followed by community sanitation or community cleanliness program. Mostly it was essential to clean up the surrounding and clean up the toilets and make an art of cleaning up the toilets. And that's how the ashram used to be spick and span. The other community activity, third one, was of community eating. Now 400 people eating together and preparing the food together while growing it also, it used to be a very enjoyable activity for a child like me. And I have grown up in such community where we were totally a self-sufficient community using the minimum resources that was required, recycling everything, reducing our use and living in voluntary poverty. Because according to Gandhi, holding on to what one does not need also amounts to violence. Therefore, the beautiful uh, life that I led in the ashram and the fourth activity that remains with me is of community spinning or charkha. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to see taklis, but I was told in the morning by uh, Mr. Taneja that he brought taklis and used to distribute it in the schools. And it was a beautiful thing to learn to spin your own uh, yarn, make your own cloth. And Gandhiji said that you make whatever you need and use only whatever you make. So this is a very simple principle of Gandhi of reducing your needs, of sharing everything with others because he is the one who followed the environmental credo in his life. <laughs> best to show you a beautiful report about International Non-Violence Day and Gandhi Jayanti special from The Hague in Peace Palace and in Amsterdam. I hope you have enjoyed the show. See you next time at different location. Till that time, take care. Namaste.